And what we are looking at here is a passage where Paul has journeyed to Athens. And Athens is described as a city full of idols. Here we go. Some of this we're going to really book through because I want to get to the meat of it. He, he arrives in Athens and discovers that the city is literally full of idols. Other uh, contemporary accounts of Athens say that it was the cultural center of the Roman Empire. Rome was the power center, Athens was the cultural center, and there was more about art and architecture and science and languages and everything else there. And it had also become sort of a, a collection of all the world's religions. And so one, uh, one Roman historian says it was easier to find a god than a man there, because there were just literally idols and fetishes everywhere. And so Paul sees this. He goes and he sees that, that the city is full of idols and his response is very interesting. He goes to the synagogue and he reasons with them about this. And, and it, it could be that he, he's saying to them, uh, you know, I know it's really tough to live in this, this idol-filled culture and so I want to encourage you. However, in other parts of scripture where he refers to this event, he refers to arguing. So my guess is he was not really com uh, encouraging and committing and he was correcting them. And um, as we go through this, the passage is really long and we're not going to read the whole thing. If you would like to, you are, are welcome to. But it's the place where he goes to different places and he talks to us and they respond to him in a couple of different ways. Look up here. He says some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers um, start to argue with him. What is this babbler trying to say? They dismiss him. Oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But other ones, um, they go to a meeting of the Areopagus, which was like the learned men of the city, and they are at the other end. They're into the latest fad. They want to know what's new. So they're, may we know what this new teaching is. You're bringing strange ideas to our ears. And it says here, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Does that sound familiar? I mean, I find, I find my culture right there. And so he, he begins to, teach, to talk to them about uh, uh, a shrine he had seen that was to an unknown god. And he then begins to say to them, I'm going to tell you who that unknown God is. And he gives them a description of God the Father. And um, he, he tells them, you know, this is not like, uh, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill, which caused a problem for those guys who made a living by making idols. That was their job. So this becomes an issue for those guys. But I love this. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And he, he talks about this whole, this whole thing. What I want to get into with you is what does a study of Athenians and the fact that their city was full of idols have to do with us? You know, is this just a history lesson? You know, the Bible is divided up into different things. There's instruction, there's, there's correction, there's encouragement, but some of it is just history. And there is a thing that we can fall into that, that is called the narrative abuse, and it's where you read that somebody did something, and because they did it, you decide, oh, well, it's in the Bible, it says they did it, so we should do that too. And the, the word can be very misused in that way. I remember meeting a young man in the pedestrian mall at Iowa City when I was, I was in school there, and he was with a crowd of, of other guys, and they all had crosses around their necks, and they were all in pretty ragged clothes, and what they had done is they looked at Acts and said, um, it said they sh everyone shared everything with everybody else, and he said, so that's how we're supposed to live. Nobody really was supposed to work. We're just, you know, you could join our group and just give us all your money, and then you can travel with us, and, we'll f and the only way it would sustain is to add more people to their group, and it was like, how how do you get that this is what God really wants you to do? Well, it's in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, so is the verse that says Judas went out and hanged himself. You know, it's, you, know you have to, have to, you know, treat the word respectfully. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple of these things, guys, because I really want to get into this, that um, 
Each city had its own deities. You remember this uh, moment when Paul and uh, his companions are in Ephesus and there's an, a huge riot. This is the point at which Paul is arrested and, and then starts his journey to Rome. But these guys for two hours shouted, great is Artemis of the Ephesians because the temple of Artemis was in Ephesus. So that was kind of the big deal. Athens was different. Cultural center, I mentioned that that way. There's the quote I gave you. Home to many temples. Parthenon's the big one, but they're really everywhere. Every public space. Uh, yeah, I just, I, this original teaching, guys, is like an hour long. And first thing in the morning, if I tried to do an hour long, I would have everyone asleep instead of the three or four of you that are asleep right now. <laughs> If somebody next to you is asleep, you can elbow them and go, quick, he just asked you to pray. And they, you know, they stand up. <laughs> All right, so why of all places did he go there first to, to the synagogue? Well, this is what I was mentioning. He, living in such an idol-filled culture was really hard, so he went to encouragement. Or he knew that living there was difficult and he went to correct them. What clues do we have? So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. He talks about here entering the synagogue and arguing persuasively. My effusers not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or standing up. This is the same word. So it's not likely he was encouraging them. These were folks who should have known better. Like us, right? We're modern American or, or modern 20th, first century people. We should know better than to worship idols, right? Should be. These were Jews and God-fearing Greeks. They have the law, which starts out with this. So why would they be doing other gods? And what does he mean, other gods? You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth below or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. They may not have been worshiping idols themselves, but the fact that he goes there in a city full of idols probably means that they, prob they were. All right. He didn't stop there. He went into the marketplace to talk to those guys. I talked about this real quickly. I'm sorry about this booking through. I didn't have a chance to get this set up because of playing. They dismiss what he has to say or they treat him as the latest fad. And that to me is where the tie into our culture begins. That when we try to bring the gospel to folks, they usually do one of those two things. They either dismiss it I was talking to some kids a uh, day or so ago about, um, about the discussion. There's a fantastic discussion in the novel The Lost World by Michael Crichton. It's the second of the Jurassic Park things. And there's a fantastic discussion in there between two of the characters as to why creation, or sorry, why evolution as it's taught in schools is absolutely impossible. Why it could not possibly be true. And as they discuss this, why this can't work, how it just, there's just no logical way it can work, one of the characters says, well then are you saying that somebody is directing this? And the first character says, oh no, that'd be creation, that's just wrong. So they just dismiss it. They don't honestly deal with it. And, and that's kind of what was going on here. But, but this is revolutionary talk to these guys. After all, they live in a city where everything is worshipped. And to a culture driven by idols, he says, we should not think of the divine being being like something that we make. It gets worse than that because he says, God has overlooked it to this point. Well, we live in this after part, right? We live in the section after which God has tolerated this ignorance. It's a message that demands a response. It's not simply a new idea that you can say, all right, I'll keep my life the same and bring this new idea in. This is, this is the gospel and it changes everything. So, I finally found my spot here. You can all breathe a sigh of relief. So what does this have to do with us? After all, we are right now in the U.S. We're the most prosperous nation in the world, or so they tell us. We don't worship idols, do we? Let's take a look at this. Most people think of this or this. Okay? When we think of idols, this is, this is what we typically think of, is, is this sort of, of thought. We don't 
see as many obvious idols as Athens had, but we do have shrines and temples here. <laughs> right? I know people whose entire life is based around their box seats in this temple. Their entire life is built around that. They don't miss a game. They don't miss an event. The, the box seats in this are thousands of dollars, like $60,000 for a box seat for the season. And they're investing that kind of money every year of their lives. They will go without many things that their family really needs in order to have that. And they drape themselves in the colors of their God. Whether it's blue and white or it's green and white or whatever color it might be. We do have these shrines and temples. There's other ones that we see in our culture too. Right now in our, our society, there's a culture of worshiping the body. That it, we have to keep it in great shape. And there's folks that do without a lot of things so that they can be in that gym. And it's like, oh, I would go to church. I would. Really, I would. But Sunday morning's my workout time. I work out every day. You know, I have to be there. Why? Or those whose God is, how much can I get out of this deal? You know, when we buy up this company and we snag all of the, the, these assets, we'll dismiss all the workers because we want that money for ourselves. I don't really care how it affects them or their families or the community that that business is in. I just want the capital out of it. We do have idols in our culture. There is traditional idol worship in a few places. But internal idol worship within the heart is universal. God says these men have set up idols in their hearts. He's not talking about something that they physically made. He's talking about something that has been put in the wrong perspective to everything else in our lives. So how does such a thing happen? How do you set up an idol in your life? How does this happen? An idol is anything that is more important to you than God. Anything. And if I was to ask you what, uh, you know, is there anything more important to you than God? All of you in this room would say no. No. But it may be as we go past this point this morning that you may find yourself. And if you do, that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. There's a, a quote I found from a, a couple of um, rabbinical scholars that said the purpose of all scripture is to root out idol worship. Is to root out idolatry. Anything that absorbs our hearts and minds more than God does. Anything we look to for the satisfaction of our souls. That's why it's, so, it's such an insidious thing. Anything that's so essential, so central to your life, that to lose it would make your life not worth living. We starting to understand it now? Anything can be an idol and everything has been one. I've got a thought in my head, but I think it's coming up soon. If it doesn't show up soon, I'll dive into it. The big four that people put into our power, money, a fairly obvious one, sex, and achievement. Of these, I think the one of musicians that we are probably most prone to fall into is this last one. Because we're striving to be excellent musicians. We want to be great at our instrument. We want to be a great singer. We want to be great at composition. We want to have all of these things that we want to aim for. But that can be, become the driving force in your life. And should something take that away, life is no longer worth living because your idol has been rattled. Anything can become an idol. Anything that becomes essential to us. I will confess that one of the things that I have to struggle with, an idol is an ultimate thing. An idol is something that that usually starts out as a good thing, but it becomes so essential to me that I can't live without it. And one of the things I really have to struggle with personally is my wife. I love her more than I imagined I had the capability to love anyone. But I cannot let her become my ultimate thing. 
And she can't let me become her ultimate thing. Because the likelihood is that one of us is going to see the other one in a casket someday. And if there is my ultimate thing, what now? How do I get past that? It's the difference between sadness and despair. Sadness is I lose something that's one good thing among many good things. Despair, and, and for that there's, there's comfort. But despair, that's losing my ultimate thing for which there is no recovery. That's why we saw so many people when the stock market crashed in, in 08, even a minor crash, not even as bad as the one in the 20s, there were so many suicides. Almost all of them, these big, big high-powered executives of the big stockbroker firms. One of, the, one of the guys drank poison, hung a noose around his neck, and as he dangled, he shot himself. He was really determined. But why was he doing it? It was money. The money that was lost has been recovered. It was going to come back, but that was his ultimate thing. For him, I imagine number one up there before power was part of it too, because power and money go pretty much hand in hand. But if the ultimate thing of our heart is taken away, life becomes not worth living. This is, this is the one where I, I do see a lot of people in our culture. If I could just have this thing, then everything that's wrong with me will, will be healed. If I could just have that job. If I could just win that person's heart, if I could just get him to love me. And, and, and you know, man, if I could have that car, whew, boy, that'd be great. If I could just have that one thing, all my problems are over. Everything is great. If I could just have that one thing. And then you get that one thing. <sighs> and now what? Look at the way that that our entertainment culture seeks fame, okay? You have these people, oh, I'm gonna be a great artist, and they become famous. And the fame is so addicting that be, they become willing to do anything to keep it up. They will go past any reasonable boundary just to stay in the public light, you know? There's a certain young Canadian singer who was popular with the, like, 10 to 13 year old crowd for a while and when he passed through that at that doorway of, of age his popularity began to fizzle and so he started doing crazier and crazier things to stay in until he was arrested for drugs he was arrested for traffic violations he was arrested for crash, crashing his car and then driving away from the the accident he wound up arrested for all these things and was not having a problem with being arrested because the people were still noticing me. That's an idol. We think of them as bad things, but they almost always start as good things that become ultimate things. And the better thing is, the more likely we are to expect that it can satisfy our deepest needs and hopes. When anything in life is an absolute requirement for your happiness and self-worth, it is essentially an idol, something that you are actually worshiping. There's a young man that I know very well who uh, is a, a, an astounding musical talent, but some circumstances in his life have taken away his ability to play his instrument. Whether it's temporary or permanent, we don't know. But it is wiping him out. It's just wiping him out because that is that thing that is the absolute requirement for his happiness and self-worth. And he talks that way. He's like, I'm, I'm not worth anything. I'm just a piece of trash. That's what he says because his instrument ability is not what it used to be. That's how you find out whether something's an idol. They can be anything. Your professional position, your social reputation, that's always a big one. Your relative fame, I can't really speak to that one because I've never been, this is like the most famous I've ever been is right here. <laughs> your family, I know a, a man who tried to make his family everything. And the success of his children was the absolute requirement for his happiness. Not only the success of his children, but the, if they had to be successful, they had to be close by, and they had to be in constant contact with him. And it took him a while to get over that, because he had built his whole life around family. And when family stopped living up to his expectations, 
which were not really reasonable because they weren't they weren't defined and they weren't clear anyway but it really wiped him out for a, a, quite a while your relationships oh if I could just if I could just have that girl she's so beautiful if I could just if I could just be in a relationship with her everything would go right so what does idol worship do to us well, idols dominate our lives. They absolutely control what you're doing, what you're thinking, how you talk, everything. They will cause you to exceed all reasonable boundaries. I believe I made a, an example of cheating spouses in an earlier message this week. I think that's an example of this. They see somebody else and say, oh, if I could just have that person. And so they exceed the reasonable boundary they knew was there. Why does a person embezzle money from their job because that money oh if I could just have this money that would fix everything and so they do it why does a person get into crime well, a lot of reasons sometimes it's to feed a different idol but it all comes from this same root we become willing to do anything to keep and serve those idols one of the big ones that hits kids your age is being part of the inner circle there's a great essay. It was an address given to the, the graduates at Oxford by C.S. Lewis back in the, in the days there. And it's called The Inner Ring. And he talks about those who want to be on the inside. They want to be in the know. I want to be part of that crowd. And as you start trying to get into that crowd, you have to abandon who you were in the first place because that's why they excluded you. You weren't like them. You become more and more like them until you begin to turn your back on the people who were your friends because you want to be part of that inner crowd. That's the idol, the inner crowd, until you're in it and you're part of the inner ring and you've done a great many things you probably shouldn't have done. You've said things you've, about people or to people that you shouldn't have said to be a part of the inner ring only to discover there's an even smaller one and you're on the outside and you begin to change again. And it is a great many evils in our world have come from that desire to be on the inside. You know? It's the logic of Nuremberg. You know, why weren't people standing up to the Nazis? Why wasn't that happening? Because they were afraid. They were afraid, what, what will happen to me? They knew it was right and turned their backs on what it was. Beauty, ooh, this is a big one. It yield, what does it do to us if that's your idol worship? It is being beautiful? Looking good? Eating disorders and depressions? A whole culture obsessed with beauty. I mean, how, can, can you... Is it possible to watch TV for an hour without seeing some commercial that's going to tell you how to be more beautiful? Use our product. Wear our clothes. Drive our car. Come to our gym and we'll make you beautiful. Success. That's a big one. I want to be successful. Okay, so what is that? You know? As a teacher, this is a thing that, that is kind of kind of sneaky for us too because we're constantly teaching our students they need to strive to be better, strive to be greater. If you're not growing, you're diminishing. If you're not better this year than you were last year. But when life happens, when you're past school, when you're an adult, suppose your best existence is maintaining a, a, your home, your family. It's not getting bigger. You're not growing. You're not doing more. This, you know, this hour wasn't filled. You know, we, we tend to pile more and more on ourselves. And I see parents doing that to their kids where we see it as, as a music teacher, I see it that they can't excel at their instrument because it is just one thing amongst an enormous buffet of activities. That the poor kid, as soon as he wakes up, man, something is driving him through the end of his week all the time after school. This day it's this, and then the next day it's this, and in the evening you do this, and, it's, and they live this way because the parents want their kid to be successful. Why? Because that kid's success is their idol. And they're willing to sacrifice their child's well-being, state of mind, emotional state, in order to have that success. That looks kind of funny, doesn't it? But child sacrifice is common in our country. We live just outside of New York City, up in the, the mountains there. And, and uh, in New York, 
Child sacrifice is a daily occurrence. And here's how it plays out. It's the dad that says, man, I want to make, I want to go up in the company. I want to be more successful. I want to get that, that promotion. I want to get up to the vice president. I want the key to the executive washroom. I want this increase. And the boss says, okay, you're going to work an 80 hour week. Then you're going to work a 90 hour week. And pretty soon it makes more sense to have an apartment in the city than it does to be able to go home. And you have children who don't see their dad or their mom for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the child has been sacrificed to the God of the parent's success. That happens all the time in our culture, all the time. And those kids wind up, a lot of them, coming into my band room broken, heart, hearts rended. And it's, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a sobering thing when one of those kids will call me dad and not realize they did. Except, unless it's Ben. But there'll be, a, there'll be kids and it happens every year that somebody in rehearsal will go, hey dad. And the room just kind of goes, Oop. and I know at that moment I can either break that kid's heart or I can close my hands over it. And so I'll just say, yeah. Instead of, oh, you called me dad. It's, if I ridiculed that kid at that moment, that would be it. Because their heart is already broken. Because their own parents aren't there. I have kids who will go through my program and in four years of marching band and concert band and all of this stuff, I'll never see their parents. I can't, there have been twice in my career that on senior night, with the whole town there, watching the seniors come out with their parents, I've had a senior kid standing there by himself. With one family, I confronted him about it. I was like, why weren't you there? This was, this was their, their only son. Here's why they didn't come to be recognized with them. But our favorite shows are on Friday night. I just walked away from the conversation. I knew I would never reach them because he had already been sacrificed for their own entertainment and pleasure. Fame. Oh, we've talked about that. Boy, they abuse everything. If you're an athlete, there's so much steroid abuse. They, people want to get sick from all of the stuff they're trying to do. The shame when it, all that fame comes crashing down. Your position. Ooh, that one happens a lot, especially in political position. That they're willing to do or say anything to get and keep that position. Love. <laughs> Lots of problems there. That's probably a teaching on its own comes down to this, unrealistic expectations. The deal is that my wife and I have a really, really great relationship because she's not my ultimate thing. If she was, I would put expectations on her that she could not possibly fulfill. She could not possibly do it. Only God can fulfill certain things in my heart. There's this void without him, without Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit here, there's a massive void in my life. And if she was my ultimate thing, I would look to her to fill that void. I'm going to be disappointed in that. She's going to be crushed under the weight of that expectation and our, our relationship will be ruined. And that then usually leads to that. These folks all sacrificed everything they valued for the God they pursued, but in the end, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. In ancient times, the gods were bloodthirsty and hard to appease. They still are. In order to keep it, an idolatrous attachment will lead you to break any promise, rationalize any indiscretion, betray any other allegiance, and it can drive you to violate all good and proper boundaries because to practice idolatry is to be a slave. And that's why there's such a difference between sorrow and despair. I mentioned this earlier. This is a quote I just loved. Sorrow is a pain for which there are sources of consolation and we experience it when we lose one good thing among others. Despair is inconsolable and we experience it when we lose the ultimate thing, that thing which gives our lives meaning. Despair grips us when we fail our idol. That's why we saw so many of those suicides. Central principle of the Bible is the rejection of idolatry. 
And scripture gives us story after story of it. I've run way over, guys, and so I'm going to kind of skip through this real quickly. The story I was going to tell you, how fast readers are you? It's about uh, Jacob working for Laban so that he could get Rachel. And he wanted to get there, and he worked for seven years, and it was still like a day because his love for her was so big, and he said, give me my wife, but he gave Leah instead. And when he woke up, there was Leah. I love the way they were. <laughs> when morning came, there she was. How did that happen? <laughs> Poof. And he says, what in the world? Why'd you deceive me? And he's like, oh, well. And it becomes the story of heartbreak for everybody involved. But the rest of the story that shows that he didn't just love her, he worshipped her. That's why seven years went by like that and why he did seven years more. That's why he went that. He put all his hopes in her. He had to have her. But here's the deal, guys. No person, not even the best one, can give your soul all it needs. <laughs> no matter how beautiful a Rachel it is, in the morning it will always be Leah. If your name's Leah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Idols will always break our hearts. This fascinating book, uh, Democracy in America, he referred to a strange melancholy that haunts the inhabitants of America in the midst of abundance. Because they were looking for that, that um, abundance to satisfy their souls. I love this. He has a great quote. The incomplete joys of this world will never satisfy the human heart. So what do we do? We identify the idols. And we can look at our most powerful and reactionary emotions are going to be tied to those idols. What makes you uncontrollably angry, fearful, hopeless? Our idols control us because we feel that without them our lives are meaningless. We can still have a problem because we can't abandon them on our own. Why so hard? Because we live in this culture surrounded by and trying to gain the approval of other idol worshippers. Even in our best efforts, we still have another idol, our own strength. So how can we be free? Only by God's grace through Christ. The only cure for idolatry is to see the God for whom he truly is and to let Jesus tell us who we are. Jesus abandoned his treasure in order to make us his treasure. That's who you are. And only when the Holy Spirit changes your heart are idols unnecessary. We are achievers, we musicians. It's hard to let that go. And it often takes us a crippling weakness for finally to discover that Jesus is all we need. As the saying goes, we don't realize that Jesus is all we need until Jesus is all we have. So the way forward out of despair is to turn to the living God who revealed himself at the cross. He is the only Lord who, if you can find him, can truly fulfill you. And if you fail him, and you will, can truly forgive you. Would you guys pray with me, please? Father, we pray asking you, asking the Spirit to make within us a clear distinction between you and everything else. We pray, Lord, that you will give us the strength to face what idols there are in our lives and to turn from them to find our satisfaction only in Jesus, only to stand at the foot of the cross and say, here, this is that thing with, without which my life is meaningless. Father, we praise you for the gift you have given us in your Son. And I, I thank you for these, these folks here in the, in the room who have, have given me their hearts and their minds. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will complete the work that you've started in them. In Jesus' name, amen.